Hi, I'm Kathleen Wong Lau, and I'm the Chief Diversity Officer here at San Jose State. Today, I'm going to talk to you about attribution errors and bias and how they can occur in evaluation situations. This is particularly important for review tenure and promotion committees, and this is part of the training that the provost's office is requiring of everybody who participates um, on one of these committees. And so we're going to start by um, going over some um, very research-based and uh, you know, theories about how we commit attribution errors um, as well as bias and some of the implications and really some of the um, outcomes that occur um, when we commit these types of errors. And so I'm now I'm going to screen share and go to um, our slides so that we can uh, talk a little bit more about these. So if you just bear with me for a minute. Okay. So um, one of the, the major ways in which we commit um, attribution errors, so we often hear about bias, um, are uh, fundamental attribution errors. So some of you may have heard of this before if you've studied social psychology or psychology. And this is how we attribute the cause for um, whether somebody is successful or not successful. So this is how it goes, right? So if the self does something good, um, you know, it's considered a trait that is, uh, you know, that, that is why you have done well. Um, and if someone has done something bad, we uh, more likely for ourselves can, uh, you know, we'll say that it's because of the situation. And we do the opposite for others. So picture this, you're, you know, you're a child, you're running across, um, you know, a room, a living room, there's a vase that's placed on an end table that's kind of close to the edge. You knock it down. Um, and the first thing you say is, you know, oh, who, you know, who put that vase there, right? So you're making, uh, you're attributing the situation to your uh, committing an error of knocking down that vase and breaking it. But if your cousin or your, you know, your brother or sister with whom you have some rivalry does the same thing, you might say that, oh my gosh, you know, this person is a klutz, right? So when it's the other who does something bad, um, then we say it's a trait. They have, they have a klutz, you know, sort of trait versus somebody put the vase on the edge of the table, right? And so we, we do this um, as a way to uh, protect ourselves, but also it's something that we commit sometimes without even thinking. And, you know, when we assign a trait, that means that it's harder to remove, right? So if my, my um, you know, dexterity and ability to wander through a room without breaking something is a good trait, or you're implying a trait versus the bad situation, that means I get to keep that sort of good status. And so that's how the fundamental attribution error works. And you can see this, you know, in headlines about um, different groups or different people or making, you know, headlines making um, attributions about why people are the way they are or different groups are the way they are. And unfortunately, we do this also um, with groups, right? So when an in-group does something, then, you know, um, that, you know, part of our group does something good. And particularly sometimes on the research shows, it's the dominant group. So even if I'm part of the out group, I might still follow this in-group trait of saying that, you know, when uh, this group does something good, it's because they have, you know, they have better morals or they are better people versus the situation. So these, uh, this error is kind of one of these meta level sort of analysis of things that we do when we're doing evaluations. And so we need to be attentive to that. Um, here's another one. Attributions about praise and uh, trajectory of people's performance um, when it comes to gender, right? So research finds that you know, we tend to um, give uh, personality traits for women when they do well. We, we sort of tend to remember that. So we say in discussion, for example, after you've had an evaluation or you're thinking about someone's performance, you'll say that, you know, she was a superstar, a hard worker, a productive person. Um, and then for men, we tend to say, well, he's a superstar, but he has numerous uh, publications and is a productive scholar. We might even name some of the things that they have done. And, uh, and so it's important to, to note that you're saying positive things about both candidates. Um, but what happens is for women, we tend to just sort of um, uh, target the behavior like this person is a good person. Um, and that goes along with how we have, you know, we in society have treated girls, um, you know, in terms of behavior in the classroom versus, you know, being a good girl, being a good student, being studious versus solving, you know, a, a hard math problem, for example. We would say that person is very smart and not remember what they actually did. Um, and trajectory versus a noble future. So um, here are some of the typical statements that are found in research. Men have the potential in terms of their trajectory. We see them as on the runway heading up, regardless of where they are at the time of the evaluation. And when we're not on a runway or the runway is blurred or unknown, so we might use language like, you know, no one can know how any candidate will be in the future versus I'm confident that this candidate is on a positive trajectory based on the evidence that's produced. And so when we do this inequitably, and the research shows we tend to do it uh, differently in terms of gender, then of 
course, this will produce results that are that are not, um, you know, not accurate as well as not fair. Um, the next one is opportunity bias. So we credit or fault the person being evaluated for conditions beyond or outside of their control. So for example, an area of research may draw from an extensive extent literature or robust reliable survey items that are already in existence because it's a long line of research um, through many academic generations. Um, population data sets, sets are available nationally because they are actually collected um, based on the demographic group that you might be studying. Um, and theoretical and conceptual development with extensive reviews of scholarship and even grant funding support are available, right? Versus someone who is studying an area of research that may draw from a newer interdisciplinary or outside of one's discipline, mainly because one's own discipline has not Done, has done hardly any research or scholarship, and so people sometimes can draw from other related disciplines. Um, this extent literature may not have com been commonly used in terms of, um, may not, sorry, commonly represent or use survey instruments that are reliable. Um, population data sets may not exist or just were never disaggregated. Um, so for example, if you're studying um, Southeast Asian Americans or even South Asians who, who are a large portion um, of the West Coast, for example, or on either coast, um, much of the data on Asian Americans is not even disaggregated. And there's other, other issues too. If you're studying LGBTQ folks, if you're studying other people, a lot of this is not disaggregated or even uh, measured. And very little has been written about how it may apply to one's underrepresented research when there is something available. So research populations may also be difficult to recruit, right? And so how this presents an opportunity bias, of course, is that the person may have to work a lot harder just to get to some of the basic things like recruiting a population, um, you know, getting a hold of comparative data, being able to have an extensive literature review that's re that may not seem related to the person um, who is reading reading the work. Um, and so it's something, you know, it could also be the, the, the different um, uh, types of journals that someone publishes in. They may be interdisciplinary and not necessarily from the traditional journals that are um, seen as sort of the bread and butter of a specific discipline. And so when we credit or fault the person, what this means is that we aren't, we aren't taking into consideration that this person's scholarship or their research may actually be quite robust, um, um, but we aren't seeing some of the things that are beyond the control of the person who's doing the research. And then we may overcredit other people for having um, more extensive amounts of work because of the ease with which they can do that work. And so we need to make sure that we are, again, um, contextualizing what we're understanding. Discipline or organization versus individual bias. Um, and so this, this research is on how we, we tend to evaluate people um, automatically give them a positive lift if they are doing something or they're in a, uh, an area of the organization that is seen as more essential um, to that organization versus being in a unit that might be newer or a unit that doesn't uh, contribute as directly to the core mission, but nonetheless is important and should be there. So a scholar who's researching an area that is established, important, has clear connection to core classes of the discipline, maybe be subconsciously, again, this is happening subconsciously, as more central to the mission of the department and of the discipline as a whole. And this creates a positive evaluation bias, right, when you're looking at a research portfolio. A scholar who is researching an area that is considered minor or only important in special topics courses or only to a specific population and not, uh, and not core courses, even though this might be uh, a judgment and error, um, because sometimes uh, some of their uh, more minor areas of interest are actually what will diversify and decolonize and, and um, you know, add um, to core courses. They may be viewed subconsciously as less central to the mission of the department and of the discipline. So this creates a negative bias when evaluating a research portfolio. Again, this is happening at the subconscious level. So what happens is you get this cognitive nudge to, of a bias towards, if we're looking at, um, you know, sort of like this, this balance, right? It just gives you a little bit of a, a nudge so that you, it's a little more positive or a little bit more negative even before you start evaluating the materials. And that's the difficulty of bias, that it can occur um, at the subconscious level and it's, and it's minor, but it's enough to get you started down the road to have a positive or a negative evaluation, more valence or uh, positive or negative evaluation down the road as you're re reviewing materials. And again, the research shows this, right, in terms of how people evaluate. Um, 
Similarity bias. Um, this one you might be more familiar with, you may have heard of before. We give higher ratings to people we identify with and understand. So I tend to understand the shortcomings that may be situationally related to someone that I think is similar to me, right? I tend to understand the accomplishments and the ways that I might understand my own. We may even think when I was coming through my tenure re review, I had less and admired this candidate for having more. Like, wow, this is really a great candidate. Um, we give lower ratings to people we don't identify with and we are less understanding. So I tend not to understand shortcomings that may be situationally related. I also tend to understand my accomplishments in ways that might threaten my own understanding of my accomplishments when I go when I went through tenure. So instead of saying, wow, this is really great. I didn't even have half of this stuff when I was going through tenure. We might feel that, you know, wow, I bet this person got the breaks or, you know, it's because this person is studying feminist literature and you know I, I might feel threatened and I don't recognize it. And so that similarity bias is actually quite powerful um, and we can convince ourselves that it's not there because again it's happening at the unconscious level and again we need to be aware. Um, and and that is, this is the one that's probably the most recognized. It doesn't mean that the other ones aren't in play but it's the ones that we most readily um, can view. Um, initial impression bias. This one is actually very important too. So our first impressions of reading through materials about a person tend to shadow or halo our entire evaluation. So this is the research on horns or halo, which is halo effects, right? Um, so this can greatly compromise our ability to evaluate clearly if we have disparate experiences or training from the candidate that we are evaluating. So it's just that first impression and how, how you evaluate or how, how your um, your automatic response to the initial review. So we, for example, we may not relate to receiving bimodal teaching evaluations, very high and very low with a few in the middle. So someone has sort of an average teaching evaluation, but when, when examined, it's because they have very high ones and very low ones. And this may not have happened to us, particularly if we're not um, you know, underrepresented faculty, the research shows that this happens. Um, our first impression may be seeing scores and immediately thinking this person is average teaching before actually digging in to analyze. And so it's important again to analyze carefully and also be aware of the research of, um, you know, the negative impact um, on uh, in terms of being from an un underrepresented racial group as well, an ethnic group, as well as being um, uh, perceived as being female, right, or being a woman. Um, there are attributions that are made in error. So when um, a URM faculty or a woman faculty are not available during office hours, they're seen as being disorganized and not caring for students. Um, and the research shows that when men, for example, um, uh, white men, for example, in particular, are missing, it's because they're doing something important. They must be doing, you know, great research or they're doing something, right? They're seen as being um, overly busy because they're important. And these, again, happen at the unconscious level. And this is through research in which they've interviewed students after, in, in these uh, controlled, um, you know, I guess studies of teaching evaluations from students. And so be aware when, you know, when you are going through your initial impression that your biases are not um, uh, uh, removing you from actually digging in to do the careful analysis. Um, we may not relate uh, nor even understand the vocabulary of a subdiscipline, theoretical orientation or a topic and feel uncomfortable on the first reading or skimming of a portfolio. So our first impression may be one of caution or one may wonder about the value of the work because you have you're not familiar with it. Um, before readings of letters of support, for example, providing context for the impact of the work nationally or in that uh, subdiscipline. And so again, um, you know, this is the first impression bias. And so it's important for us to be aware what is our first impression and then make sure that we are comparing how we're evaluating um, after our first impression. So you might be asking, so what can be done, right? This seems kind of overwhelming. I'm telling you that's happening at the unconscious level. Um, you know, um, you know the, these errors are not usually done intentionally. Certainly they can be, but I think in a majority of the cases, an overwhelming majority of the cases, these errors um, are unintentional and conscious. So the first thing we need to do is to make ourselves aware, to review these types of errors and make ourselves aware. And so you can review these slides. They'll be available for you. Um, on this uh, Canvas uh, module. Um, you need to remember that these errors creep in and do not attenuate over time, but they actually become more pronounced and worse over time. And this is really important to remember. So you might be very aware in the moment that you are going through um, you know, the portfolio and you are writing notes and stuff and you are you know, really making a good effort to, to analyze. But what happens is over time, when you don't look back at those notes, we actually, our, our brains start using these biases, right? Because biases are actually an effort to try to shortcut and be more efficient in understanding and, um, you know, evaluating and, and making drawing conclusions and that lead to action, right? So 
Um, so what happens is over time, the details and those notes and the actual thing that you did, the effect will, you're starting at a higher place, so that's good, but the effect will wear off. Um, and so the amount of time that passes between when you actually write these notes and when you actually discuss them, the, these other, these, these bias effects that you try to correct will start creeping in and they'll start becoming again more pronounced. Um, and so you might hear yourself say something like, I don't remember exactly, I just know that I was impressed with the number of publications and the quality was good. Now that sounds like a good precise, you know, statement, but it actually isn't, right? And so, especially when you're going to be comparing, um, you know, to others who, are, who may be, who may have either different opinions or different um, uh, interpretations of what this person's record is. And so, um, you know, so it's important to do these things in a timely manner, but also to review your notes carefully um, and, and make sure that you are paying attention to those notes and actual details to eliminate um, the process of this, um, you know, this, this effect of it becoming more pronounced, these biases over time. Um, and here are things that we can do. There's a lot of research on slowing down thinking. And so what slowing down thinking means that you're using rubrics, you're using notes, you are, you are doing things at the meta communication level. So you're facilitating discussion in a way that slows down people's abilities to go back to these schemas and these biases at an unconscious level. So you use carefully constructed rubrics, make sure everyone's using the same one, make sure there's enough detail in them so that people can write adequate notes asking for evidence so that you can write some of that evidence in so that it will again cognitively prompt you at the time of discussion and when you're making that final analysis. Take good notes, of course. Read your notes and make meta-analysis notes after reviewing, making sure that you link that meta-analysis to specific items of performance. So um, you want to, again, make sure that your notes are careful um, and that you are, you know, checking for some of these, uh, some of these biases. You want to hold each other accountable to carefully refer to notes during discussion and ask for evidence. And so sometimes, again, you know, there be, could be like, this is all a thumbs up or this is all a thumbs down, but you need to go through the process of having people, again, go back to their notes and then be very specific about how, you know, how you at that time you were evaluating it, um, how you're looking at it. Now, it doesn't mean that you're, you're fixed and you're not taking into account other people's uh, sharing of, their, of how they're interpreting um, the evaluation, as well as how, what, what evidence, how they're looking at some of the evidence. And so then, you know, you might alter some of that. So then again, make sure you write that down, right? So that you are understanding in the moment um, what you are doing, and then you're also, again, holding each other accountable. Give time for committee members to follow the argument or specific case they may detract to their notes also. So, you know, it's, it's totally, it's important to say things like, everybody take out their notes on this, this specific thing. Does anyone have notes on this? Right, so, oh, I forgot about this um, aspect of this portfolio. Does anyone have notes? Maybe we need to break everything out and look at it again, right? So be, be, be willing um, to entertain other people's perspectives, but also the, um, the ability for everyone to track and then also look at it again. Um, consciously facilitate, facilitate equitable discussions and comparisons. Make sure that it's not the loudest, most extroverted, or most highly ranked person, or most willing to interrupt others who evaluate, whose evaluative comments and notes are heard. This is really important. This is probably the number one complaint that comes into my office regarding, um, maybe my number one, it's probably shares number one with other ones, um, uh, of, of being um, in a committee where they felt like, um, you know, it was a done deal. And so the most, you know, the most uh, extroverted people spoke, kind of threw it out there as a done deal. So that being, saying something like this is a done deal, or this is clear, or obviously, usually these kind of words actually um, create a bias, um, you know, uh, uh, what is that? What we say, a floor for bias, right? So, so you're saying that the floor of discussion starts here, right? And so anyone else who feels otherwise is going to have to rhetorically enter to, to in order to say that. So try not to create bias floors for discussion by doing that. Um, and that's, this is important because, you know, it's, it's poor leadership actually to do that. Um, recognize when you are out of your area of expertise and acknowledge it, right? And so if I'm, I'm, um, if there are areas of someone's portfolio that I feel like, you know, I am totally out of my depth to evaluate, but this is what I can evaluate. And you can ask other people questions, right? Not in an interrogating way, but to inform you if they are more expertise in that area. And so it's important to search again for other types of um, 
of evaluation if you are actually not an expert in it. So it could be in those letters that come from other nationally known um, people who are doing work in that similar area. Um, you might need to read those more carefully. Um, you know, you might need to read more carefully, um, you know, the, the comments and, and notes from uh, the committee within that person's department um, and within that person's, uh, you know, college, et cetera. So this is why it's really important for people to take um, good notes and to, to pass on information to the next committee that is usable um, in terms of being able to facilitate these really hard discussions. And remember that bias and attributions don't just lower evaluations unjustly, they also raise evaluations unjustly. So though both of the effects are, are, both things are in effect, right? So you can set a bias, bias ceiling and a bias floor um, and not really realize it. But uh, at the same time that you are lowering others, you are also raising others unjustly and not based on what, what uh, should be the evidence that you're using. I hope you found this um, helpful. And um, if you have any questions, you are always uh, welcome to contact the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion at San Jose State University. Wish you the best. You're doing very important work here um, for our university and we're just trying to help equip you so that um, you can do that job better. Thank you very much. <laughs>